everybody. Back with another edition of the new Maroon Getaway vlog. We're uh, still moving through uh, Richard Heinberg's essay, his long essay, uh, Human Predators, Human Prey, uh, Society as Ecosystem in a Time of Collapse. Uh, we are in part three, section seven, uh, entitled Politics, Democracy and Authoritarian uh, Authoritarianism in the release phase. And again, this uh, release phase uh, is referring to uh, the what's called the adaptive cycle, which is, has been um, explained and talked about in, uh, in the previous parts. And you could, you can go look up, uh, you know, this to see exactly what the release phase um, is, uh, is all about, what it covers. So, so just to get started, as I've discussed at greater length, in another recent essay, it is probably wrong to think of democracy as a recent invention, since many pre-agricultural societies tended to be highly egalitarian. In contrast, most early states appear to have been ruled by kings and pharaohs. Uh, several millennia after the agricultural revolution, which began roughly 10,000 years ago, notably in Greece, a limited form of democracy emerged as a means of regaining some of the personal freedoms and participation in leadership that had been mostly lost with the advent of cities, states, and kings. During the past two centuries, democracies have become much more common than ever before, especially in European nations and their former colonies. This trend is often attributed to quote-unquote enlightenment and a popular yearning for liberty. However, it is also possible that the vast production of wealth from colonialism and fossil fuels provoked rising expectations for wider distribution of both economic and political power. Initially in America, among the minority population of European American males with property. Um, actually to see a really great examination of this point is um, a publication that was put together by uh, historian Charles A. Beard uh, called an economic interpretation of the Constitution of the United States. And uh, he wrote this, uh, well, it, that, if I remember correctly, it was published in 1913. And uh, what's interesting about this particular analysis is, it, is it's about as objective uh, breakdown of really the economic factors that had, that drove the, the formation of, of the United States that drove the, you know, the, the laws, the politics, um, you know, if you, if you really want to find out what a place is all about, you got to follow the money. Um, all that talk about liberty and freedom, it's, it's rather curious to talk about those things in a country that's had, that had chattel slavery for most of its history. So you, you, you gotta, you gotta ask a few questions as to who this freedom and liberty pertain to and who was included and who was excluded. So continuing, from the mid-19th century onward, the threat of Marxist revolution may also have helped persuade the quote-unquote predator classes that it was in their interest to give the general populace at least a semblance of participation in governance, kind of give the illusion of having freedom to placate uh, some of that uh, angst and dissatisfaction in, in having the vast majority of people be basically exploited openly and, and pretty egregiously. So sort of placate them with the illusion of actually being free. If these speculations are at least partly correct, then we might also hypothesize that democracy tends to be favored most in the growth and conservation phases of a civilization's adaptive cycle. As was the case of ancient Rome, whose republic endured for roughly four centuries, but gradually withered following the creation of the empire in 27 BCE. When there's plenty to go around, the real rulers, who may benefit from a degree of anonymity, indeed, can afford to be relatively generous with the public, while sometimes cultivating figurehead and puppet leaders who faithfully serve elite interests, even though they appear to arise from and represent the people. Just as prey participate mostly passively in their own domestication, suitably sated and propagandized middle and working classes may help ease the occasional tensions of elite domination. And again, I think this, this whole process, you know, examining how you domesticate people 
is um, is something that's really worth a lot more serious investigation because this is sort of this is the most critical aspect of state formation, getting people to um, you know so, sort of participate in this project is uh, how do you incentivize people giving up a fair amount, convincing people that somehow you know they're going to be able to to gain by again giving up some degree of, of autonomy the ability to, just, to, to have some degree of self-determination. So if you can kind of give the illusion that people have uh, autonomy and self-determination and again, quote unquote, freedom, then you've, you've, you've pulled off a pretty neat trick. I can't help but look at how entertainment, right, various forms of entertainment is used to create the conditions whereby this domestication can be much more effectively uh, accomplished. But as a release phase in the cycle approaches, there is less of a surplus available for, re for redistribution, and the predator classes are likely to be in less of a mood to share. As long as there is surplus, the prey classes can be mollified with regard to the disproportionate amounts of wealth being aggregated by the predator class, because the prey's well-being is also improving, though less, and because of opportunity for class mobility real or perceived, offers the hope that they, too, could become part of the predator classes. And the, 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 the quote that comes to mind, um, and I think this has been, I think this is attributed to John Steinbeck, but it, I, I, it might be actually falsely, I think it was falsely attributed to him, where it, where it was said that uh, socialism was never successful in America because uh, everybody is basically a temporarily embarrassed millionaire. You know, there, there there have been some other, I think, really great, uh, some, some other great historical analysis to, to to examine again what we see, particularly in in the case of the United States. The historian Morris Berman has talked about how, in his estimation, he sees America and and the culture that defines it as being one of um, of hustling, and so he, he calls America a nation of hustlers. Uh, which I, th I thought actually was really interesting. If you read, he has a great blog called, called Dark Ages America that's, that's actually worth a look. But when surplus evaporates, the effectiveness of these mechanisms of appeasement fades. As inequality grows, so do social strains. Management of mass perception increasingly focused on assigning blame becomes an increasing preoccupation of politicians political commentators, and strategists. At the same time, elites are likely to come into greater conflict with one another. As public relations specialists working for elite interests employ clashing narratives to spin events, prey classes are more likely to be drawn toward political extremes. So actually, to, to that point, um, we, we, you really can't ignore the fact that a great deal of time and energy and and money and work is put into really this this uh, this entire field of uh, perception engineering, perception management. You know, really propagandizing people, uh, creating narratives right that serve you know certain interests. And the more money you have, you know, the more the more resources you have available to you, the better you are at being able to shape certain narratives. So. This this is you know this idea that there is a there are professional obfuscators um, it can't be ignored you know I think we just have to be very mindful you know there are people who have a very very much a vested interest in sort of bending the truth or lying by omission uh, that that very much is is a part of the backdrop against which all of these things are you know, being examined. Such a moment provides an opening for powerful personalities who promise to vanquish villains and return the nation to a condition of lost stability, moral uprightness, and magnificence, right? a type of sort of purity in this idealization of, you know, of the past. Popular enthusiasm for checks and balances between governmental departments, fair elections, and respectful discourse withers in favor of scapegoating, dirty tricks, and winning by any means. The niceties of democracy can be dispensed with if only the great leader can deliver. The strong man may be a member of the predator class, metaphoric alpha wolf 
whose main goal is to more effectively fleece the sheep. On the other hand, depending on social circumstances, a release moment may provide the opening for a true populist, a member of the prey classes who is persuasively intent on leveling power and wealth within the nation. But given chaotic conditions, even in that case, the formal operations of democracy may still be held in abeyance. And in case you don't know what abeyance is, uh, abeyance is a state of expectancy in respect of property, titles, or office when the right to them is not vested in any one person, but awaits the appearance or determination of the true owner. Unfortunately for tyrants, the release phase of a societal adaptive cycle is an awful time to be in charge. The former golden age cannot be restored. Someone must eventually be held to account, and the authoritarian leader is the most visible culprit. But overthrowing him or her does little to right the ship of state. The inexorable process of creative destruction must work its way through until there is the ecological basis for a new phase of reorganization.